touch on from where we left off actually last time. Recently, there was positive developments in regards to the sale and possession of the good barn welcomed by Sikhs in the UK. How damaging and what sort of message do you think that could have sent to Sikhs if that had actually gone the other way, if they'd been banned from possessing good yeah, barns? I think this again all came up the issues we discussed uh, in the previous shows around the Sikh identity, uh, what the what the issues facing the Sikh community are in this country. And we touched on the manifesto, touched on the census, all of those things actually highlight the issues around uh, with hate crime, with discrimination on the Kakar. And I think it was the third issue in the Sikh Manifesto, which was about the code of practice for the Articles of Faith, the Panj Kakar and the Sikh Turban. All of that stems from this inadvertent and ignorant discrimination at schools against the Qurban, the Dastar, the school kids, the Qara. And there are, there are cases that we've had to fight, even through the courts, to, to protect uh, the rights that we have. And I think the, the, the offensive weapons bill that you're referring to, which predominantly was focusing on the big Qurban, the three foot Qurban. And basically what happened was government had updated its uh, legislation mm -hmm. through the offensive uh, weapons bill. Uh, and this was going through its third reading in the Commons. And that's when we picked it up. Uh, uh, as a civil in the Sikh network and, and the Sikh federation, the divinity has been pretty really much spearheaded it. Once we picked it up, and this was missed by many people, on two for one, the government in its consultation in the Home Office, this is where we challenge them, because we have roundtable meetings with the government, and this issue never was presented to the Sikh roundtable to say, look, this is coming up, it's going to affect the Sikh community, what are your views? The government, I think, consulted nearly 170 organisations through its rounds. Not one of them was Sikh. And some might think, well, actually, that might have been a genuine miss, because this, the bill wasn't targeting Sikhs, per se, it was about knife crime and tackling that, which is a, a, a academic portion in London, certainly. But actually, it was, because in the notes, and in the detailed notes, the Qatar was specifically referenced. So they knew, and in the detailed notes, and this is where largely by Divinity and others went through all the case, and you can, when you're passing a bill, you'll know there's, there's reams of documentation. Looked at it and, and saw that the Home Office advisors had said that this will impact the Sikh in India. Yeah and the wearing of the Qurban. And we recognize that it will be okay for religious occasions like the Imam Shari. So they themselves knew it would impact the Sikh community, and they thought that they had enough provision for religious uh, ceremonies like the Imam Shari. They were the only ones referenced where the groom will hold the Qurban. So somebody had advised them that actually the law's fine, uh, as long as weddings are okay, that's really all they needed for. Uh, or they come to that conclusion themselves. So they did all this work, yet failed to engage with the Sikh community and any of the active Sikh organisations to get their perspective. Um, so this is where th there is concerns of, of that actually there were an ulterior motive that actually they possibly did want to combine them. Um, so when, when we picked it up, we immediately raised it with the, uh, the chair of uh, APGG, but she, and she wrote to the minister, uh, Victoria Atkins, to say, Actually, this is an issue here. Yeah. Uh, and the issue was this, that in the legislation, it would have banned the, the carrying of any curved blade greater than 50 centimetres. So 50 centimetres is about that. The large Kaban falls well within that remit. So it would have been a crime to carry uh, the big Kaban. Uh, Possess it, sell it, and private possession. Mm -hmm. So that was the key thing. Sale and private possession was the, was the real uh, sort of changes that they brought in, in general for knife crime. So that would have meant you would not, it would have been a crime to, to walk around with the Kapan. Nether Titans, where the Panch Bihari have the Sibi Shabao, would have fallen under that. Uh, Datka would have fallen under that. Maharaj Shastra in front of Guru Sahib, Maharaj in Gurdwaris would have fallen under that, potentially. And private possession. Most, I don't know, high percentage of Sikhs will have Baddi Kapan of Sibi at home. Either on display or somewhere. After a wedding, you keep it. Uh, and it's at home. That would have been a criminal offence. And the sale of which, so sales in stores at Gurdwaris, Sarmak stores, Sarmak events, 
all of that would have been a crime punishable by 12 months in prison. Mm. And when we challenged the government there, they were like, no, no, we're not targeting the students. That's fine, but in your language you have been. Because you, you can't then say we were protected by the religious ceremonies. Mm. Because having it at home isn't a religious ceremony, they could argue. And they've only referenced the Imam Bukhari. And we talked about Nagar Gitan, we talked about uh, Gatsha, we talked about other uh, 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 events. So none of those, when you reference one, it makes it very difficult in law then to argue that they're religious ceremonies as well. So, Sleed Kogil tabled an amendment, uh, which had cross-party support. And this again, power of that better representation in Parliament, that she was able to get cross-party support from the Conservatives, from SNP, from Labour, um, from the Lib Dems to say, go to the minister and say, look, this is wrong, this is our amendment, uh, and you are effectively discriminating against yeah. Sikh communities. And I must say respect to, to Victoria Atkins because she recognised it straight away and said, in a meeting that she called, and, and some of our uh, team went along to the meeting, and effectively said, no, this will not happen. We'll do what needs to be done to ensure that Sikh communities are, are not discriminated against in uh, of, of the and protection. And we then spoke in Parliament yeah. uh, and raised this issue. And thankfully, uh, she also met with Sajid Javid, the Home Secretary, and outlined the issue to him. And he gave his commitment yeah. that actually we will do whatever it takes within government to ensure that this doesn't become an issue. And I think it was with that, then the government accepted the Sikh community amendment that we drafted with Sleed and turned it into the government's own amendment. Yeah. Because otherwise it would have had to go through uh, uh, debates and etc. The government actually tabled the amendment themselves. And it was word for word the same amendment. In that they would expand the, the religious ceremony to religious reasons. And that effectively then said anyone who's wearing the kafan, selling the kafan, possessing the kafan for religious reasons is, is, has a defense in the law. Which is what the actual definition of the law is. That even for small kafan or the big kafan, we have a defense of carrying and wearing. We don't have uh, we don't have a uh, exemption so much, but we have a defence, and that effectively helps all sides of the because the only uh, the only side defined in any legislation is the fifty sentiment. So that was welcome, yeah. uh, and I think that is something that, that reassured. And this would have happened. What would happen? This would have gone overnight into law, and many Sikhs were were kind of just un unaware of all of this. We held a lobby. Uh, in Parliament to raise this issue, and it was with five other issues uh, besides this issue, which we'll come on to. Um, and the Qatar are, are sacred to us, and this is how these things start. If something gets put into legislation, you're then having to react. So this is somewhere where we were very able, very quickly, to be proactive about it and, and get it in, and, and to avoid hundreds of seats being filed, filed the law. And just to give a quick update on what's happening now is that. It were, uh, another amendment was suggested in the House of Lords by Lord Kennedy, uh, which would, by name, give greater protection, legal recognition to the Qatar. Uh, and we're working with the Minister to say, okay, how can we increase uh, that if, if, if we can get that through in the Lords as well. So it's ongoing, but we have secured the current amendment in law, and if anything, we'll get greater. Do you think Sikh organisations should be prioritising some more awareness around the Kampan to ensure that non-Sikhs are aware of what it represents to Sikhs? I think this is a, this is a uh, touchy area, because ultimately we are a minority in this country. 99% uh, of the public in this country will know very little about Sikhs. Uh, historically they might know, on Facebook they might know, and when you start, we, we have always been reluctant to put a big publicity campaign around the Kafan. Because to them, it's a, it's a sword, it's a knife, it's a weapon. In the general public eye. And the reality is, yes, you can educate them. But you do not get that airtime. You are not going to get the, voice, that, the coverage required on the mainstream to really bring it all through. So you get that small snippet. And in there, it doesn't land. Mm -hmm. Actually, what you want to do is be protected by law, be free to wear it, and then if issues come up, you deal with them, which is what we've been doing for the last 50 years here. Uh, and I think you just have to be sensitive to the environment you're in and actually what the climate is to when you raise these. And yes, if we had restrictions legally, then you would, you would, you would fight those. Of course. But actually, we have the defense and we have that protection. So 
It's one of those where if a member of the public raises an issue, then you, you educate them. Uh, and, and I think that's the approach that we've taken. Uh, I want to bring an issue which is causing widespread concern among the Sikh community, the case of Jagdar Singh Johal. Concerns obviously intensify, Manish, particularly following the claims that Jagdar has been physically and mentally tortured. I recently spoke to Jagdar's MP, Martin Doherty Hughes, and he, along with Jagdar's family, are vowing to continue pressing this case to get Jagdar back home. Have you got any updates on the Jagdar Singh Johar case for us? Yeah, and, and, and Jagdar's case has been something that I've been sort of intimately involved in from the day he, he was abducted. And I'm, I, I mean, I still remember the, the, the phone call I had from Dodgy, who I'd never met, never spoken to before. Uh, he said, look, my brother's been uh, abducted. Well, he says he just disappeared. Mm -hmm in Punjab and I just got married uh, and then from that day effectively that, that, that we've been supporting the family and the campaign to do this in our uh, civilization lobbying and and it's well well, well publicized and what's happening is now what 470 mm -hmm. days in incarceration uh, 15 or so plenary hearings and only one charge to date mm -hmm. in a charge sheet which is thousands of uh, pages long and he's mentioned on 12 lines and in that case, the co-accused, the named individual, Jimmy, the runs in Jimmy, who was the named individual on the FIR, which Jimmy was arrested, has been bailed. Uh, so he's been granted mm -hmm. bail from those cases. He's been acquitted from all the NIA cases that then subsequently came off the back of that one case uh, of all the targeted killings of what I was to do. So the individual that was at the center of it has been acquitted. Uh, Jiggy's case, so what the latest is, uh, the NIA cases, so those six cases that he's not been charged on, he's just uh, co accused on, they are, uh, and the NIA is the National Intelligence Agency with the FBI and the CIA yeah. equivalent, um, they've all been, there's a stay been put on by the Supreme Court. So the NIA, again, has produced no evidence, uh, no charge sheet at the Mahali Court. They then put a petition in to move all of these cases to Dibli. And that Dibli be transferred from Naba, President Punjab, to Dibli. Yeah. Because there was a threat to his life, that was the claim. Uh, and it just shows that they're trying to put as much pressure on Dibli, isolating from his lawyer, isolating from his family, uh, and, and trying to break him. Uh, because they have no other evidence. And it would be easier for them to better control and influence the judiciary in Dibli. Um, but ultimately, so, so that decision is pending. Uh, and we're confident that, that we'll be able to challenge that. Uh, it, was, it was raised before we were successful, the legal team there. So until that hearing at the Supreme Court, um, which is, keeps moving with March, we're now looking at the end of March, and now you've got an election happening, so it might get moved to more, because obviously judges get displaced. Yeah. So all of these delays happening at that level. So those six cases effectively are on hold. Uh, and the two other cases in which he's, uh, often job cases, one of them he's had, he's been granted technical bail, uh, which is a police court case. Mm. So he's had bail on that case. Um, but the Bagdaprana case was the original case in which he was abducted, he was tortured, physically tortured, uh, for five days in Bagdaprana, in, in Mogha, uh, electrocuted, stretched. Um, and those hearings that he'd been going to, to, to court around, he, he was charged up. They've had a number of hearings, a number of uh, witness statements. Again, no witness of all those that have been testifying has named Jiggy, has physically said, yeah, he's involved. If anything, it's all the opposite. They've no one's heard of him. Um, and we're applying for bail in those cases, but it's a standard delay tactic. He was supposed to go to court uh, last week, and no one was brought to court. The judge was on holiday. So there's all these delay tactics that, that he was supposed to be presented, the police don't present him. So the police are effectively overriding the, the, the power of the judiciary at times and disrespecting that. Uh, or that he will go and they will get it adjourned for some other reason. Or a police officer uh, in the recent hearing said, no, I don't want to give evidence to them. So th this is a power that they can apply uh, and turn this whole hearing into a circus. And the next hearing is now uh, on the 1st of March. Uh, and we'll see what happens on that day. But ultimately, it is a pure circus out there that anything can happen. And this is where I think pressure is now being placed on the British government. I and mean, if you look at what's happening here, we've had a new letter campaign, mm -hmm. which is part of the new network we'll come on to that, where the Sikh network is going around, a real lobby network, to really put pressure on politicians, because that's where it counts. 
the foreign secretary uh, 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 is, is failing to meet with the families. Uh, and, and this is something also where letters have gone to Jeremy Hunt, uh, and pressure from ministers of the APPG. He is reluctant to meet the families. And because if you look at what's happening, you've had Matthew Hodges, who was arrested uh, and charged and imprisoned in UAE, in Dubai, uh, for espionage cases. You've got the Nazneen case in Israel, uh, in Iran, sorry. Um, and you've got the Chennai Six. Uh, and also the Ethiopian, who was also released recently. And even the Egyptian girl, who was released recently after having uh, too, many, too many tablets uh, painted in, in there. So all of these, where the foreign officers in, in got directly involved, uh, they have managed to successfully release uh, those individuals, those British citizens, or have put enough pressure, made sustained pressure in the mainstream, as in Nazneen's case, where she was. What is different to Vicky? Is it that it's India, uh, and Britain, given its relationship, do not want to do anything that will upset India? And we've seen this in the documents that have come out for 35 years or so. Or is it the fact that um, it, he's a Sikh? And with him being a Sikh, they don't, certainly don't want it. It complicates the issue with raising it for Sikh infants in, in India. And people who sit there that actually know there's no discrimination, you really need to look at this case. Because here you have a British citizen who went to get married, who was tortured, denied access to, to his uh, uh, diplomatic council, denied independent medical. Even the wheels of justice are an absolute shambles of being influenced. It's not had appropriate legal representation. And the British government can do nothing. Despite making commitments to Parliament of extreme measures, they have not done anything of, of any substantive follow-up. Um, now, whether that's linked to Brexit, again, is where the whole word keeps coming back in, is that actually they are, they are, are, are trying to negotiate better trade and, and they don't want to put pressure on India at this time. Uh, and they would rather sacrifice the human rights and liberties of a British citizen over trade. And we saw this played out in 1984. So it's not unknown territory or uncommon tactics by the British. But I think India do what it's doing. I think the it, reality is, is they're in a, they're in a stuck, well, they have nothing on him, but they can't let him go either. So they are delaying the trial. That's what Jafar was reminded for when he came here, because that's what it is. I think the only I hope will be an opportunity we've got is that is to maintain and sustain the legal, uh, the, the political pressure, uh, and make the British government act, because that's how they will act. Is when we, when for the public turn up on the streets, when we do the protests at the Foreign Office or Indian House or wherever they be in London or, or uh, Edinburgh, where we do smile them, or whether we do social media campaigning, which is very active, or whether we do letter writing campaigns. All of this creates pressure on politicians to act. We now have an opportunity with the March elections in India. And it's recognizing, taking advantage of that opportunity, but can we exert enough pressure through Sikh political connections and British political activities uh, to say, can we maneuver in a scenario to get this resolution? I think that's where the focus and effort is coming. And I want to turn our man to Kashmir for the next issue. I wanted to speak to you about following the recent Kashmir attack. How concerned are you about tensions between India and Pakistan escalating with potentially catastrophic consequences? I think, again, you have to look at this in, in, in the wider context. It, firstly, it is, it's deeply concerning because any military issue uh, and struggle between India and Pakistan in, effectively keeps the court in cross right in the middle. That's where the, the fight will be in Punjab. Who will lose their lives? Ordinary Punjabi Muslims. Uh, on both sides. Mm. And ultimately, this is again gameplay, dangerous gameplay by Modi government. Uh, and if you think back and look at it, you've got the national election. We saw Indira Gandhi run uh, a, a, a national election where she was completely behind the polls on, uh, on, 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 on communal separation and, and, and uh, making religious politics an issue nationally, and that's where she started the whole 8421 Sikhs or Atavadi and terrorism, demonizing the Sikh community. Modi has, has had history in this in regard. I think it's an, an issue of BJP are struggling nationally, and they need a big issue to galvanize the support. And war and war against Pakistan, and Pakistan being the, 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 the culprits involved with everything, is, is number one in their, in their, in their rule book. Um, <clears throat> I think you also have to look at 
the change in administration in Pakistan with Imran Khan. He is a well-known sportsman, uh, very intellectual, very smart, well-recognized, well-spoken, not your typical Pakistani prime ministers of the past where they could have had these uh, political game playing. And I think if you look at his uh, statement recently, it, it, it was really wise when he said, look, it's very easy to start a war. But it's very difficult to end one. Uh, and the fact that his door is always open to peace talks and he's willing to, it puts India on pressure now because it can't, it's not all that macho uh, bravado. The, the flexing of your muscles and we've got nuclear powers and they've got nuclear powers and this whole game plays out. Uh, uh, and actually, you've got to remove, and what Imran Khan has done is remove war from a populist agenda and said, look, this is the reality of war. Look at Afghanistan. Every foreign state has said that Afghanistan cannot be uh, uh, complete with military. It has to be a diplomatic solution. And Modi's we'll under pressure now to react to that. And if you think about 550 years of Guzman uh, Gezi, uh, and the, the, the positive things that were happening with, uh, with the Qatar sort of corridor, all of these things are now put at risk because of this. Now, I'm not condoning the attack or saying anything, but if you look at the history of Kashmir, what has been happening in Kashmir, what the Indian army have been guilty of, the crimes against humanity, the torture, the, 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 the rape, that the people of Kashmir have complained about and been lobbed at the UN, you can't ignore that. You cannot ignore that. And as, a, as oppression is driven by the state, the reaction is of the people, mm -hmm. of that oppression. And you can't look at one in isolation to say, well, they, this is how the people reacted, uh, and therefore why it would justify being there. Actually, what, why, what happened that they were compelled to blow themselves up? And what is happening in that territory that it is resulting in this outcome. And that's something that UN, Britain, need to do a lot more on and look at Kashmir. Same look up and down. For 35 years, the UN rapporteur has not been allowed into, uh, unfortunately, has not been allowed into Punjab. Still, he's not allowed into Kashmir. Why is that? People need to ask these questions uh, and less of the, 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 the warmongering and actually come to finding reasonable and necessary solutions to this because that is in a concentrated area, two nuclear superpowers, the seats in the middle. All of that says is that actually the call for us independent Sikh homeland are justified both politically, legally, historically, that actually a buffer state in that region would be better for lasting peace uh, anyway. And I think this is something that now is the time to have these conversations and, and have them intellectually, not warmongering and, and threatening and labelling as terrorists and extremists and using that as a, as a, a lever to not talk and talk to people. But then at the same point say, well, we were open for dialogue. Uh, you can't have it both ways, and I think this is a concerning uh, development what's happening there, but it's something that the Sikhs, and I'm, I'm proud to see that Sikhs have stood and supported our Kashmiri uh, brothers in that area and supported them with Langar and mm. shelter and support, uh, and that's the Sikh DNA, and that's, that is what we're proud of, and I think it comes back down to what we start this whole conversation with, is our Sikh identity, our Sikh DNA of activism, our spirit, uh, our revolutionary spirit, but our protection of everyone else, so we will not only respond protect our own rights, but also those uh, of everybody else. And I think that is no, it's demonstrated no better than what's happening in Kashmir today. Just a final two minutes, but one thing I wanted to speak to you about was coming back to the Sikh network mm -hmm. here. Looking ahead for the next 10, 15 years, what are some of the main aims in a nutshell of the Sikh network? Yeah, it's, it's, and I think, again, going back to why we start the network, because we recognise you have great charity groups there, great youth groups, uh, great rascals, great infrastructure in our Gurdwale and, and good political pressure in our Sikh organisation, but actually there was a whole part of the community that was also out there, and the network was to connect all of those. Where we want to get to now is, obviously, if there, there may be a general election in June this year, so we'll refresh the Sikh manifesto. We are now launching the Sikh survey 2019, that will be coming soon, so we'll, we'll be sharing that on, on the Sikh channel as well, and uh, get people involved in that. We are also expanding the network into various specialism networks. So we've had huge support so far. Uh, we're now setting up a specific group for the Sikh lawyer network, legal network, the Sikh professional network, uh, the Sikh charities network, academics network, and political network. So those, anyone in those fields that want to get more involved, then we'll be putting followers on the Sikh network on Facebook, or on Twitter, uh, the Sikh net, on our, on our uh, website. All of this information is out there, and we, we'll be putting more out to get more of you involved. And when 
not only is it just a case of like, right, here's what you need to do, we're always looking at offering mentoring schemes, so using three to stand in Parliament to mentor, coach people who want to get into politics. We have a range of professionals in all industries, consulting, uh, uh, civil service, banking, finance. Uh, we're working with them to create mentor schemes uh, and guidance schemes. So anyone in professional background who sort of wants to hear that, that you can get a mentor, you can sort of help shadow them and, and guide them. Um, but also some of the big issues that we have getting professional legal advice, uh, professional academic reference and research to support it. All of that is where we're looking at spreading the network out. And then I, again, I will encourage everybody to follow us on, on, on social media, get involved, share your details, and actually do your survey because this is a great way that you can uh, utilize your skills and professional uh, experiences for the farm, because ultimately that's what really counts. Good luck with all that, and thank you again for joining us today. And thank you everyone at home for watching. Make sure to tune in next time for the politics show. Vaidurjiki Kathasa, Vaidurjiki Kathasa.